I'm Shelley Rubin. I'm the founder of Blade of Brass, uh, the host of tonight's program, a new nonprofit, and the first of its kind solely dedicated to nurturing socially engaged art. Uh, we make grants to both organizations and to individual artists, and also create learning opportunities like this one here tonight that you're all have come out for. Uh, just to orient you so you know where you are, you're on the eighth floor in the eighth floor gallery. It's a private exhibition and event space created by my husband, Donald, sitting right there, and myself, uh, to promote cultural and philanthropic activities. Uh, the title of the exhibition in which you are sitting uh, is Stealing Base, Cuba at Art at Bat. Cuba at Bat. Uh, a visual exploration of art and life through the varied perspectives of Cuban-born artists using baseball as a metaphor. I did not know that baseball was a passion of Cubans, but apparently it is, and they've used art to speak about their predicaments. Uh, tonight we are not talking about Cuban art, um, as wonderful as it is, but we're here to hear a discussion between Thomas Skokie of Strike Debt and Sarah Ludwig of New Economy Project. Deborah Fisher, Executive Director of Blade of Grass, will moderate the discussion. I'm sorry. Um, after the program, have a glass of wine, continue the conversation, enjoy the exhibition, and if you have a chance, sometime soon, you can go down the block to the Rubin Museum of Art, which Donald and I founded uh, eight and a half years ago now. Donald, we believe that art should be a part of everybody's life all the time, so we made 17th Street a place that you can enjoy art in every possible way all the time. So come visit us down there too. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Shelley, thank you so much. And uh, I want to thank uh, Shelley and Donald. Uh, this is always a really great environment. And, uh, and thank you all for coming out when it's really hot outside. I mean, it would be nicer to be sitting in the park. No, so uh, it's true that the Blade of Grass is the first funding nonprofit that's solely dedicated to socially engaged art. And uh, what we do is we fund, we do grants to individual artists and uh, and to organizations. And we also uh, create programs just like this one. Uh, and we have great website content. So, so please continue to participate in what we do. If you find it interesting, if you're an artist uh, or an arts organization, check out our website. And if we are, uh, we keep doing programs like this. And then also follow us on Facebook uh, and Twitter and uh, check out a lot of the great website content that we, uh, that we create. Tonight, um, is, is about reimagining death, right? Uh, Parallel Fields is a, is a series that we do in which we pair an artist and a non-artist who are roughly thinking about the same thing in an effort to get at what art can do in everyday life and what art can't do and what, and what partnerships between artists and non-artists look like, right? And we're talking about a particularly important uh, topic tonight, which is debt. Um, our guests are Sarah Ludwig, the co-director of New Economy Project. You founded this project in 1995, and you've been focusing on uh, using a combination of legal, community organizing, and public education strategies to work with hundreds of neighborhood groups to fight discriminatory banking practices and press financial institutions and their regulators to be more accountable to low-income New Yorkers and, and communities. In 2000, Sarah co-founded New Yorkers for Responsible Lending, a statewide coalition of 160 organizational members and a major force for financial justice in New York State. Sarah serves on the board of directors of the Center for Responsible Lending and the North Star Fund, and teaches a course on community equity in NYU's urban planning program. So she knows what they would do about debt. Yeah. And Tom Skokie is a visual artist and adjunct professor at Syracuse University. He's currently a PhD candidate at the European Graduate School in Sassafras, Switzerland. His master's in fine arts in sculpture from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And he tends to work with the concepts behind money. 
Recent projects include transforming his debt from art school into a work of art made out of the exact same amount of money, of real money, which he is selling for the price of his tuition debt. A, collect a collective farm on public land in upstate New York. Gutenberg, a pirate bar. Oh, sorry, I didn't say that right. Hold on. Rewind. Gutenberg. Okay, thanks. Uh, which is a pirate printing press. And the Rolling Jubilee, which is a collective project of strike debt. Uh, the format of tonight's discussion is going to be uh, two 10-minute presentations that kind of ground everybody in the work that these two amazing individuals are doing. Then we're going to talk about uh, how collective approaches to debt work. Sarah, you're on. Use the mic? Or yes. yes. Yeah, I think use the mic. It's, it helps people, I think. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I tend to belt it out. <laughs> okay, I'll use the mic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Peer pressure to use the mic. Okay. So good evening, everybody. Um, as Deborah said, I represent an organization called New Economy Project, and we just changed our name. So some of you might know us as NEDAP, which was our name for 18 years. So I'm still making the transition. If I laugh, somebody can zap me, because I've been trained never to say the old name again, except to say formerly known as. So NEDAP was founded. Jesse, New Economy Project was founded in 1995 with the mission of working with community groups in New York City, particularly in low-income neighborhoods and communities of color. And our mission is to work with groups to promote community economic justice and to eliminate discriminatory economic practices that harm neighborhoods and perpetuate inequality and poverty. So, you're going to hear me talk about debt and how we approach debt in our work with community groups, both and with low-income New Yorkers. And I'm going to show a couple of slides, but I want to give you a little bit of the broader framework for what we do at New Economy Project. So the N in NEDAP, our old name, was neighborhood. And that's one of the many lenses that we have when we look at economic practices, is how they affect neighborhoods. We're interested in what we call neighborhood equity, because where you live has so much to do with your experience uh, as a person and your prospects in life. It has to do with the quality of education that you're going to have, access to jobs, to food, housing, <coughs> infrastructure, bless you. These things so much are rooted in place. And we look at how banking practices and financial institutions in particular shape neighborhoods. Neighborhoods don't just happen. They are shaped largely by flows of capital, by access to capital, or lack of access to capital, or harmful forms of capital in communities. And so we have a racial justice lens, we have an economic justice approach to the work that we do with community groups, particularly in neighborhoods throughout New York City that historically have been cut off from access to fair credit. Neighborhoods that historically have been redlined where expensive, predatory financial practices are prevalent, are alive and well, and really perpetuating wealth inequality, perpetuating segregation, and um, a whole host of other issues. So, we focused on banks and financial institutions, as I said, and, and Wall Street, for years, since you know, 1995 is not ancient history, but it's certainly been a sort of central aspect of our work way before the financial meltdown, way before the crash, and, and now, and how these practices affect neighborhoods. So we look at abusive financial institutional practices, predatory lending, certain kinds of high cost services that target people who don't have equal access to what we think of as kind of first tier financial services. We look at the failure of banks to invest in communities, even though there are state and federal laws that say that banks have an affirmative obligation to meet all community credit needs, as is if these laws don't exist. We look at the unchecked speculation by banks, by Wall Street institutions, and also the relentless and massive, I, somebody help me come up with a giant word, a word that just, this huge lobbying force that, that Wall Street exerts on Congress, on the state, on our city council, and so forth, to resist any kind of reform, any kind of accountability. Um, and it's been um, something that we've watched very closely and participated in, in fighting against. And so for us, debt 
the question of debt is very much at the convergence of all of these issues. We're familiar with the kind of explosion in credit that led up to the Wall Street crash, to the meltdown, the financial meltdown, in not so recent time, not so distant times, just a few years ago. But we don't talk as much about the the attending explosion in debt and debt collection that kind of came with that uh, proliferation of credit. We look at debt as kind of the nasty, the debt collection, and I'm going to talk about how we start looking at debt collection, as kind of the nasty undertow of that credit explosion that's affecting so many people. So maybe you know about harassment by debt collectors. Maybe you know because you're on the other end of the phone when they call. Maybe we had a, there's a Melanie and a Domingo who have given out our phone number where I live. There's nobody by the, those names in my household. Uh, but we get these endless phone calls from debt collection firms. They're menacing, they're scary, they're, they're, they're um, intimidating. And I'll tell you how we, again, how we got into this work. So at New Economy Project, we use a lot of different strategies working with community groups to not just address discriminatory and abusive financial practices that that make sure that neighborhoods don't have access to the housing and the quality of, of small businesses and other things that are the lifeblood of, of neighborhoods. Um, but we also work with community groups to promote affirmative models, community-based credit unions, worker co-ops, community land trusts. If you have a question about this, we can, we can talk about it. And we engage in a variety of strategies. So we do media advocacy where we um, help people tell their own stories, people who are affected by abusive lending, people who are affected by abusive debt collection practices, help them ex amplify what's happened to them because there's no substitute, obviously, for people telling their own story. But we also document what's going on through research, and we just put out a report a couple weeks ago that I'm gonna tell you about in a moment. We do shareholder advocacy, we own stock in 13 publicly traded companies from some of the largest banks on the planet, not just in the country, but on the planet, to debt collection firms, to some of the companies that do trade schools, right? They have, you know, become an air conditioner repair person, become a home health care aide, they advertise in the subway. These are actually companies that target low-income people of color for loans. It's about drawing down federal funds to get say, with tuition assistance, we'll get you loans. And you get a lot of people to enroll. That's what the schools do. This is their bonus operandi. And then they get that federal money that they draw down, and then they don't offer a quality education. People end up in debt, but without the skills that they were promised. And I cannot tell you the number of people who are living under a debt cloud from just these exact trade school practices. So we, have, we go to these shareholder meetings. We help people get into the shareholder meetings so they can speak directly. Look in the eye of the CEO of Chase, of J.P. Morgan Chase, or of Asta Funding, or of some of these schools that I'm talking about, and say to them, this is what your institution did to me, my family, my community. We bring those stories in. We do a tremendous amount of community education. We meet with community groups. I have a colleague tonight, uh, Monica, who's out meeting with a West African group and talking about the rights of undocumented immigrants vis-a-vis -vis the banking system, which is doing this in French. Um, and we also do a lot of legal support. We have a bunch of lawyers on our staff, so we use interesting cases to change, to change things and expose them. And about eight years ago, we set up a hotline because we were getting calls not just from the community groups that we were working with, but from individual members who were at neighborhood presentations that we were doing, who said, you know, I was at that forum last night in the church, in the community center, wherever it was, and all the things that you described, that's what happened to me. And I didn't realize that that was illegal. What can I do? And so we kind of de facto started this hotline that we formalized in 2005. It's a financial justice hotline. And since we opened it, we've gotten more than 8,000 calls from low-income New Yorkers who are calling us because, you ready for this? They found out after the fact when they went to draw down funds from their bank account and found their bank account was frozen, or when their employer said, you know what, I have this court order and I'm gonna start garnishing your wages, so instead of the $150 check, it's gonna be $120 for the next five years, kind of thing, or less. Or people whose tax returns were intercepted by the IRS because of outstanding debt. Because what's been happening is, 
The debt collection industry has found a way to use our court system, our public sector, the court system, as a debt collection mill. And we've done a lot of research that bubbled up from the experience of so many people calling us day in, day out, particularly older New Yorkers, virtually all of color, many immigrants, many people are women, a lot of people who are disabled, both who have mental and physical disabilities, who call us all the time with the exact same scenarios. So that they found out that they were sued when the judgment had already been entered against them. Because what the firm, the debt collectors are doing is they're using the courts, they're filing these hundreds of thousands of lawsuits every single year and not telling people that they're suing them. Now, how do they do that? Isn't that, isn't that illegal? Isn't that a violation of fundamental due process as protected in the United States Constitution? Who wants to say, yeah, it's illegal? Who thinks it's illegal? Who thinks, I don't know, I have no idea. Who thinks, no, it's not illegal, they can do that. Well, the people who raise their hands that it's illegal are right. It's not just illegal, it's profoundly harmful to the people that this is being waged against. And what's going on is <laughs> two things. One, around the explosion in credit, whether it's student loans, mortgage lending, consumer credit, credit cards, and so forth. And let me just say, all the research shows, not just this explosion in indebtedness, but that so many people are turning to credit to cover basic expenses. So people don't have, this is a really fundamental economic justice issue. People don't make enough money week to week. They're struggling check to check. And they're turning to credit to buy food, to pay for their pharmacy items, right? You know, in other places, I'm talking about this so much in New York. When I travel outside New York City, people are like, to get that gas tank filled so they can get to work, so there's all these ways that credit has exploded and people are vote, turning to it for their basic needs. But what's emerged through this, in de this debt explosion is that banks have found a way to make a lot of money through their credit practices and they make a huge volume, we'll just talk about credit cards, so credit card loans. And they know very well that a lot of people are gonna be able to pay back these loans. So they're gonna make money for the people who are repaying Right? And if you pay late, they like you better because you've got to get the interest and the fees. And then what they found is they have to charge off the debt if somebody's not paying. Right After a certain period of time of not getting payments from people, the debt gets charged off, if you heard that expression. When the debt's charged off, where does it go? Well, this gigantic multi-billion dollar industry has emerged in the last 10 or 15 years of companies that buy this charged off debt. This is their business model for pennies on the dollar, right? They, it's cheap, it's charged off debt. So the banks get the money for, from the debt buyers. The debt buyers then hound people relentlessly, mercilessly, aggressively, that's pretty nice, aggressively, to collect anything. Because if you buy a thousand dollar debt for a hundred bucks, you pretty much, if you get more than a hundred bucks, you're doing pretty well, right? So that's the, that's the slice of the debt collection industry that's proven to be the nastiest. The banks, meanwhile, they charge off the debt, they get a tax benefit for charging off the debt, right? And they make loans to the debt buyers to buy the debt portfolios. So it's very enmeshed, all of this. And the debt buying industry, many of these companies are publicly traded on Wall Street. It is very big business. I'm gonna show you a map. Oh, there's our new logo. That's not a map. Oh, yeah, okay. How many people here have a good cognitive map of New York, you know, a map in their minds of what New York looks like? Okay, we are, what, around right here? There's Central Park? Yeah. This is a map showing where judgments were entered against New Yorkers in debt collection cases automatically because people didn't show up to challenge the case. If you don't show up to challenge something, there's an automatic judgment that can be entered against you. That's why people don't even find out until that judgment is used to freeze your bank account, or that judgment is used to get your wages garnished. It's like, wait a second, I was sued, I didn't even know. We get calls from people day in, day out. We look up their name in the court's databases, and we find out that they were not only sued by the one company that 
uh, froze their bank account, but there's just five outstanding judgments against them. This happens all the time. So this is showing the concentration of these default judgments by neighborhood. And what you see, this is Southeast Queens, this is Central Brooklyn, so here's Bedford Stuyvesant, you can't really see that label, here's Canarsie, Jamaica. These might be well our middle income neighborhoods in Southeast Queens that are predominantly black communities. They're some of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the borough. If you look at the census, you'll see that. So this is not just an income equation. This is a matter of racial targeting, we would say, and racial justice. So these are the communities that are historically redlined. They get flooded by uh, financial institutions offering what we think of as destabilizing high-cost credit. Then on the other side, on the collection side, they file these lawsuits en masse. People don't show up. And if you see these, can you see these cross hatchings in the back, these diagonal lines? These are neighborhoods that are more than 75% of color. Black and Latino, actually, that's the index that we use. So I'm going to start wrapping up because I don't know how much time I have. But let me tell you a couple things. So this plays out in communities. There are people who are having their way. This is depressing collective wealth, if you want to use that vocabulary. Money that's being extracted. We did a report looking at the debt buying industry and these lawsuits that covered the years 2006 to 2008. We looked just at New York City. In one year alone, there were about 300,000 lawsuits filed in our civil courts just to collect debts. Less than 1% of people sued in these lawsuits had legal representation. I forget the exact number, but it's more than 80% of these ended in these automatic judgments because people weren't served with notice of the lawsuit. And in that period, it's not fully three years, it's in a two and a half year period, I would say, more than one billion dollars was extracted from these same communities as a result of these creditor lawsuits, these judgments and settlements. Think about how much money that is. I don't know how many people, are, are brains able to fathom a billion? I'm not sure. It's a lot of money. They got just siphoned out, drained out by an industry that is predicated on fraud. So that's why we bring a class action lawsuit. We have one right now pending on behalf of 120,000 New Yorkers, virtually all low income, against this brand. So let me just wrap up by saying that as we start to understand what's going on in the debt buying industry and the relationship of the industry to Wall Street, we start to think, well, how can we bring broader action and help people understand that this is not just a matter of individual transactions. This is not just a whole lot of people, one after the other, who are affected by this. Many people in the field, and some of our closest allies around the country, approach these issues very much from an individual, sort of atomized perspective, right? That it's just a matter of making debt collection fairer. Right? That's a fair debt collection practices. No one should be sued without getting their notice. Right? Nobody should be sued on debts that are past the statute of limitations, which happens routinely. Everybody should know exactly what they're being sued on. They never do in these cases. You have no idea what these debts are. So let's make it fair. Let's make lending fairer. Let's make sure people have access to loans that have all the attributes of sound lending that we believe in. And these are good principles, and these are very important policy directions that a lot of groups take. But we need to think more broadly than that, because those sort of fairness approaches don't get at the root causes of why so many people are tangled up to begin with. The fact that people don't have enough money to live from check to check, so many people. The fact that the banks wield the kind of power that they wield over our body politic, if you will. So, I can't think of another way to put it. So help me, be less pretentious. Okay, so <laughs> the point is that we're very excited about this idea of the debtors union that Thomas is gonna talk about, precisely because it takes something that so many people are working on sort of from a consumerist point of view, that it's about, you know, fairer consumption, right? Let's make sure that people uh, are treated fairly. 
but doesn't get at the root causes and is individuated, and it looks at it from a more collective perspective. So I, we have some critiques of it, which hopefully I'll be able to articulate clearly later, but um, it's something that we think is a great place for us to be shifting our thinking and, and having a new context and conversation. That was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, New Economy Project, they're my heroes. They know the stuff I wish I knew, and they get angry at all the right stuff. Um, and if, if you're not angry listening to that, then I mean, you know, we, we should be really angry. Um, so the, I'm, yeah, I, I come from an, from an art background, but I love this concept of parallel fields because it's, it's sort of how my studio practice has been playing out over the last 10 years or more, where I will come up with stuff that I want to do, but then I'll need to partner with professionals who don't have art backgrounds to help me actually figure it out and, and do it. Um, and so, just like Sarah was describing, these, uh, you know, Wall Street, this goes around with a giant vacuum cleaner and sucks wealth out of the 99%. Uh, you might be doing everything that our society tells you to do, that you work hard, you get good grades, you get a job, and whatever wealth you try to make for yourself, it just gets sucked up so that someone who isn't, you know, just, they're just relaxing on yachts, I think, most of the time, they get all of the, the wealth that you create. And so, Thinking of this in terms of like classic Gandhian, Martin Luther King, non-cooperation, non-violence, uh, Wall Street can't do this without our cooperation. And this, this is why I think debt is such a fundamental battleground. Uh, last year, simply occupying physical space, taking your physical body and sitting down in a public space and saying, I'm not going to move because shit is fucked up and bullshit, and I'm just gonna sit here. That was an act of, of uh, civil disobedience. That was an act of uh, direct action, just occupying space. And it turns out, yes, although that's all technically legal, peaceful assembly, free speech, all that, as soon as you use those rights, those are, are taken away from you. Um, so, to me, I, I'm thinking, well, where are those points of contact where we're cooperating with Wall Street? And for myself, and for, for most of us, uh, every month I pay my debts. Uh, every month, my wife and I send over $1,000 to Sally Mae. And uh, for other people, it might be credit card debt. For a lot of people, it's mortgages. For a lot of people, it's payday loans that was supposed to be a two-week thing that have suddenly they pay back they pay back what they've borrowed three or four times already, and it's seven months later, and they're just you know it's a it's a poverty trap, it's a it's a debt trap. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we all simultaneously just stopped cooperating? Wouldn't it be nice if we could jam that vacuum cleaner, and all of the wealth that we'd be producing, we'd still produce it, but it would circulate amongst ourselves. We'd be able to keep more of the money that we make. We'd be able to meet our basic needs. And by cooperating together, by creating new social bonds with one another, we'd be able to meet our needs collectively. Um, uh, one, one of the things that sometimes when people hear about strike debt, they think, oh, strike debt's trying to create a world without debt. I'm not sure that that's possible if, if debt is just a social bond. Um, I think that Strike that is asking us to, to ask ourselves what are, what are our true obligations to one another. So I would say the debt I owe to you is that if you get hurt tomorrow or if you get sick tomorrow, you shouldn't go bankrupt for that. You shouldn't be forced into poverty. You shouldn't be forced into debt. We can create these kinds of social bonds with each other so that even though I'm healthy, I can pay a little bit of money to make sure that when you're sick, you get the health care that you need. That's the true debt that I owe you, and that's a debt that we're currently defaulting on. Uh, a true debt that I owe you is that you should be able to study what you want to study without selling the next decades of your life. Uh, 
That's a debt that we're currently defaulting on. For the amount of money we spent on the war in Iraq, we could provide full tuition-free education at every two and four-year public school for the next 58 years. So it's not as if we don't have the wealth, we're just spending it on things like going to war in Iraq. So how do we do this? How do we collectivize our struggle and how do we collectivize our refusal? Because if, it was, if there was an individual solution, I would do it as an individual. If it was as simple as me stopping my debt payments, I would do it. But that doesn't work. That would be committing financial suicide. I don't want to do that. But what I do want to do is take a financial risk with millions of other people who, because we've built the strength in numbers, it's no longer as risky. We can, we can do it together. Um, and we can, and let's destroy Wall Street. Let's make them work an honest living. Let's, let's make them do something useful for society. I'd be happy to give them some money if they were giving me some valuable service or product. Uh, they might learn something. Um, so I've been toying with this idea since shortly after how uh, Occupy started. And I'd like to sketch it out in brief. Uh, I can't delve into it in, in total depth, but maybe we can a little bit later. Um, this is just one of my debts from my uh, student loans. Uh, Deutsche Bank is the current lender. It's serviced by Sally May, and it's guaranteed by one of the 35 uh, guaranteeing agencies, which is kind of silly because um, USA Funds has outsourced its guaranteeing job to Sally May. So Sally May does this itself. And it's all, in turn, guaranteed by the federal government. Um, is uh, the uh, Ready for Zero website still working? There's this website out there called readyforzero.com. Uh, I'm going to just really quickly log back into it. If you feel good to uh, email me if you want to follow up. What's your password? <laughs> it's my social security number. No. Um, so, readyforzero.com is the exact opposite of the website that I would like to build to help us organize a debtors union. Readyforzero.com is aimed at people who are, I guess, we would call them what used to be the middle class, or they're, they're people who have debt, but have the means to pay their debt and want to get out of debt by paying it. Um, and so the, the beautiful thing that I want people to, to see, because I want to I want to build this, is they made it very convenient for a lot of people to aggregate their debt information. So I can just log in, and if I've got a credit card, uh, I can just add my credit card information, and they will be able to, in a 100% secure way, scrape that information from the credit card company and aggregate it with everyone else who's got credit card debt from that company. Um, if I have got a loan from Sally May, oops, I can just, add my Sally May, Sally May login info, and it will automatically scrape that information. Um, student Loan Hero is a similar thing, but it's geared specifically for student loans. You add your loans, and you uh, type in the information that you need to access the uh, NSLDS website, which we showed you before, and it can automatically scrape all of that information. So the, the basic gist of this is I would like to create a, a tool that will help us um, take everyone who has debt to a particular institution and have that be the, the union. You know, it's, it's modeled on like a labor union where you have a factory in common. Well, we don't have a factory uh, anymore, but if we... Now, and I was briefly sketching this idea out for a reporter at the New York Times, and I said, like, yeah, but how do you, how do you organize a debtors union? You know, we don't have a factory where we all meet every day. He said, oh, that's easy. That's just what social media is for. And 
I think he's basically right. That, uh, we could create through social media an easy way for people to do this. Um, and then it's just a matter of getting some economists who tell us, oh, you have reached the threshold where if everyone who has debt to Bank of America refused to pay, Bank of America would be in serious trouble, or a section of Bank of America, or one of the servicers for Bank of America. I mean, this is the question where we need something like parallel fields to get the economists telling us, here's where we can focus on, here's, here's the weak point. And if you just target one mid-sized lender and take down one mid-sized lender or make their stock drop 10% overnight, it's just the proof of concept that you need. I think everyone I talk to, they're ready to take a risk. They're willing to take a risk if they believe it will work uh, to, to get back at Wall Street, to, to take back their lives from Wall Street. Debt is the way that Wall Street occupies our lives. It's time to evict Wall Street, right? So, uh, if we were to go on strike, let's say that, just for sake of argument, we got everyone who has debts with Sally May to, uh, do any of you have debts with Sally May? If we all joined together, and instead of making a payment to Sally May every month, we made a payment to an Occupy Wall Street escrow account every month. Suddenly, there's a million things we could do with this, there's a million variations of it. I'm not. You know, those are decisions we'll have to decide collectively. Do we want to build up an escrow account as a collective bargaining chip and say, okay, now we have five demands because you know it took us a while, but now we've got demands. We did it earlier, but um, you know, you do these five things and we will release these funds. That might work, and it would it would you know if we ask Congress to do this stuff. I mean, come on, Congress doesn't work for us. Congress works for Wall Street. They're never going to do this. If we stop paying our debts, I guarantee you, if enough of us do it, Congress and Wall Street will do anything we ask. They will come begging to us. Um, now, it's, I don't want to have any illusions about how difficult this would be to organize. The scale we would need to organize is gigantic. I hope it's not going to work to just get 10,000 people to do it. It's not even going to work to get a million people to do it. We had a million student loans default in the last year, and the system has just said, we can, we can absorb that. You know, we've ruined these people's lives, and we will just put them through the machine and make spam out of them. We can deal with that. Uh, it's going to need to be larger than that, but it's not like this hasn't been done before. It's not as if Gandhi only had 12 people who he was organizing. You, know, it's, you can get millions of people to do things uh, when the cause is just like this and when it's a matter of, of survival at this point. It's an existential question. It's not, it's not just a moral question. It's not just a technical organizing question. If we're going to survive, we've got to resist. Um, so rather than do like a collective bargaining chip with an escrow account, I kind of like the idea of just doing it ourselves. We'll build up a big extra account and we will make a public bank. Uh, we will lend to each other. Um, and we will lend to each other differently. We will create different kinds of social bonds. Uh, obviously there's a huge risk. I personally, at, at the current time, have uh, good credit. If I apply for a job, that helps me out. Um, and Sarah can go into great detail about how credit scores and employment it's basically just an alibi for racial discrimination in hiring. You're not allowed to do that, technically speaking, but you can still discriminate against people with poor credit scores the same way that you used to be able to discriminate against people because they have the wrong color of skin. It just so happened we rigged the system so that uh, people like myself who have blonde hair and blue eyes tend to have better credit scores. Um, but wouldn't it be nice to create our own credit reporting agency where the people who go on strike actually get a higher credit score. And you know, a, you know, a credit reporting agency, the, the three big ones right now, they're basically just, we're gonna give a number for how valuable you are as a source of wealth for Wall Street. But wouldn't it be nice if we had one that says, look, we're just interested in how much we can trust you. Uh, if we lend you money, are you going to do interesting creative things with it? And are you, are you going to be reliable? Are you going to be there for us? Are you willing to strike? 
These are the kinds of things. And I would love to give credit scores to Donald Trump to say, like, look, we just can't trust you. You can get negative numbers. I would love to have an Occupy Wall Street credit reporting agency. So it's a grandiose idea, but so were things like the Rolling Jubilee a couple years ago. And uh, I, it's, it's the only joyful way to live is to take on these kind of big projects puzzle them out. I love, I love them as puzzles. I love Wall Street as a puzzle. Um, and there are weaknesses. There are ways to, to hack into it. So I don't know how I am on time, but yeah. I think... Uh, it's time to discuss. Yeah. Okay. You guys both have mics. Uh, thanks, Thomas. That was great. Uh, let's, let's, start, let's start hammering this out. Uh, we're here to... Yeah. This is right up my head. I know it is, Don. <laughs> 15 years ago, Johnny and I had this space, we had to move into the park. But I started, it all came, I started my business, my whole career, by working for half uh, time funds, labor management health funds. We were, we were being charged 25 to 30 percent more than Blue Cross. Blue Cross had a sweetheart deal. Blue Cross had a sweetheart deal with the state to get a very big discount. The union funds, their funds, management, their funds, management and union, uh, were paying full charges for a health care, for hospital care, for medical care. I came to them and I said to them, don't pay the bills. I will negotiate the settlement for you. For you. You have money in the bank, but you're not, you, you should not pay more than Blue Cross gets, which gets a 25 to 30 percent discount. And in some cases, I held the money for six years. We had the union lawyer, which would be voluntary lawyers, file an answer in court, ask for a bill of particulars. The credit agencies would call, and we would get on the phone. I must have had a thousand credit agencies first five years call me and I said we'll look into it. We'll get back to you. They'll call another two months, we'll get back to you. We're looking at it. And eventually it got it went to a collection agency. The collection agency is authorized, since they're getting fifty percent of the money, to, you know, give us half of that if we were set up. We had to have to pay them. But we we paid and then finally after about eight or ten years, slowly over that period of time, they gave us a deal equivalent to Blue Cross. So we were able to negotiate discounts. Now, every insurance company now has followed that model because I worked for Edna, United, Cigna, the unions, and it really grew into a, a fairly big company. But it all had started with negotiating debt. We closed. We closed personally four hospitals in New York who were asking for advanced deposits to take people into the hospital. Hospitals. The Joint Commission comes in every two years to do an inspection. There was a hospital in the Bronx, Union Hospital. It's closed. We brought 20 people in for the hearing because we had a right to the hearing. And I remember George Roth, a union guy from the furniture, got on the, on the table with 20 people around and said, this hospital should close. This hospital is robbing money from the working class. Don, this is a great example so, of exactly uh, what How you can about. fight back. Yeah. And then they called me the next day <laughs> and they said, Don, where your friend? You, yeah. Where your friend? Why are you treating us like yeah. that? I said, give me the same guy the Neil Blue Cross does. They're going to treat you the same way. And so it like, work. So we, this we, is, we yeah. We closed more hospitals in New York by just doing what Ralph Nader would do. And you just, you, you're on the right track. I love what you're going to do. And I wish I was 50 years younger. I would have joined you <laughs> and, 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 and try to settle as much of your debt as you possibly can. Uh, refocusing on, on this notion of uh, 
refocusing on this idea of debtor's union, right? The first question, obviously, you know, like John kind of blew past it, but um, how feasible is this? Is it doable? Like, I'm asking you first. You're asking Sarah. me. All right. So. Yeah. It's a big idea, so sort of which aspects are feasible? I think on its face, it's, it's feasible, right? It's something that there's so many people who feel, you talk about bonds and common bonds, right? Sort of through, that there's so many people feel an affinity with others because of the struggle that they're going through. We work with so many people who've already been super marginalized because of their indebtedness. They're not, they're, you know, have, you know, again, their, their wages have been garnished, their credit reports have been ruined. I just want to clarify one aspect of that, which is that employers increasingly look at your credit report. They're not looking at your credit score, although I like the idea of the credit score, you know, sort of the people's credit score. Um, but so employers nowadays, particularly the retail stores, the big box stores, or the chains and so forth, they ask people to pull their credit as part of the job application process, as if your credit, your managing of credit, is somehow a reflection of your character, as if your managing of credit or your credit situation is an indication for them of your likelihood to commit theft. Because you know anyone who's struggling financially is going to steal, right? So. This is something that the credit bureaus have really convinced employers, even though there is not one study, there is no evidence that connects your credit report with your performance as an employee or you know, as a worker, or your likelihood to commit theft. And they even admit it under oath when pressed. The credit bureaus say, yeah, we actually, we can't prove that. But that's how they're marketing this. So you have a lot of people who would be nervous about resisting payment or stopping their payments of debts because of these very real consequences. Because if you don't pay, that's what goes on your credit report. A credit report's just a history of your repayment of loans of any kind. And it's something that is not a public service. This is, you know, these giant big three companies that Thomas alluded to that are making gobs of money selling your information to other creditors and now increasingly to employers. Your credit information is used when you look for an apartment. It's being used by insurance companies. They want to know your credit score because they say it's an indicator. If you have that credit score, if you're, well, there's an insurance credit score. But they want to know what's in your credit file because if you have financial struggles, you are, they say, more likely to file claims with the insurance company. I mean, there's just all this stuff that's not substantiated. And when you look at how credit information is really a reflection of its existing inequities, right? Then it's really used as a proxy for race. It's being used as a way to perpetuate inequality. So people get that maybe, but let me get back to the original question, because I just want to clarify the way that these credit reports get used and to thwart economic opportunity for people. A lot of people have already borne those consequences. I can't remember if it was you, Laura, or you, Thomas, who said this to me the other day. It's kind of, what's the risk for people who've already had their credit ruined? Just, I mean, they're, they're not able to pay their debts if they are their debts, right? So I would suggest that the feasibility hinges on a couple of things. One is I think it's a very good organizing mechanism. I think that when I think about our work in New York, to get people to buy into a debtor's union, we would look to community groups, to constituency-based groups, groups that have a base already, a common bond already, people who work with an organization, whether it's identified as by a neighborhood or some other affiliation, and have them as a sort of organizing mechanism understand what this is about. And I think it would scare a lot of the people we work with if they think that the debtors union sign up and we're going to go on strike next week. That is really about building up that base and that force and that common bond and that collectivity so that people together can decide what's the appropriate action. That it's not a fait accompli that it's going to go on strike at any particular time at all, but that the leverage is built over time as people see the power of so many people in debt joining the union. And I would also say that starting with students, I think, would be excellent. That's really interesting to me because what you're talking about is, is, is representing the debt. You can do this right now, but we, it's, it's, it, it, 
One of the things that really strikes me, Thomas, about the way that you're talking about debt is that you're you're working in a lot of ways to represent it, right? Like it's it's so wrapped up in morality and uh, and character and this and personal assessments and this individual concept. When in fact, it's actually it's it, it's very difficult to see the debt outside of yourself, outside of your uh, your character and your body and your contract with, with somebody else, right? Um, and, and it seems like the real power of a debtor's union is simply about representing what a debt looks, what everybody's debt looks like. Is that kind of where you're going? Yeah, I, mean, I, I would say, I think it's an open question if it's feasible or not. I don't know if it's feasible. It hinges almost entirely on how many people can we get and how willing are they to take a risk. If we, it's completely 100% feasible, I think, if we get enough people who are willing to take a risk. But it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the mechanism to organize it first, to be solid, but it wouldn't surprise me if we can only get 100,000 people who are willing to do this and that we don't ever reach the numbers where we could be effective. But I would like to give it a try. And, but to me, the, the, that feasibility question is all numbers and how willing they are to, to, to take a risk. I would say that it used to be easier to see this visibly, or at least like in the um, it, It's a Wonderful Life when everybody knows Mr. Potter and everyone's mortgage is to Mr. Potter, that collectivity is there. It's, it's, there's some level of community organizing we can still do, but it's much harder when I've got a mortgage with Bank of America, and my neighbor's got a mortgage with Wells Fargo, and you know what? You know if if we got the whole neighborhood to strike, it would be diluted. When what I really want is like everyone who's got a mortgage with Bank of America, whether they're in Seattle or in New York or in Arizona, it's just a Bank of America strike, and so that's tricky because it's a bunch of strangers. And of course, when we talk about mortgages, foreclosure laws are different in every state, so it's really not um, the kind of thing we could do with mortgages but, um, on a national level, but there might be a, a way to do it um, locally. And it, it is hard to visualize this because, well, one way I visualize it is a, a whole bunch of people, and we've all, we're all tethered vertically to Wall Street. And I want to cut all of those tethers and build tethers horizontally like each other. But one of the things that that does literally is destroys these kind of community ties with each other. So it's, um, it, it does isolate people, it does atomize you, and it does teach you to think of yourself in that way. So even if the debtors union only builds leverage and scares the right people, it could be effective. But even if it starts creating the, a, a new kind of subjectivity as a debtor, as a collective, that, that we are all debtors, even if you don't have any personal debt, you're affected by debt because of municipal debt and sovereign debt, um, I think that could, uh, new, new forms of collectivity can, will necessarily lead to new forms of social bonds. Sure, and yeah, can I respond to that? Yes. So there's a few things. One is it's not just the challenge of figuring out, let's say we all have mortgages in this room and some of us have them with Wells, some with J.P. Morgan Chase, some with Bank of America, some with Citi. It's also that they then sell those debts. They then, those mortgages get sold as securities on, on Wall Street. It's very, very complicated. I had one slide that I didn't show, which was the life of a debt. If anything, just to show the complexity, it flashed up there for one second. It's the same thing. You don't need to show it. It's okay. It's, it's so easy. Yeah, why not? Yeah. All right. Um, so, you know, and there's different kinds of debt, but I think that there, to the extent that this is a collective response, I think people are really grasping for that collective response. So, yes, there are technical challenges here. There's no question about that. You the more one scratches the surface, the more complex it, it seems like with so many things. 
But there are other forms of collective resistance that people are using with the banks around foreclosures, for example, um, you know, and, and, and taking them on. Even though people don't all have the same lender, they're able to band together and, and, and take on the banks in canny, strategic, creative ways. So I think that people are exhausted by what Wall Street has done to our economy, to communities, to our political systems and so forth, what we've let it do, I think I should say, it's not like some passive situation here. Um, and that a lot of the groups that we're working for are looking for those folks, looking for those creative mechanisms that don't, that allow people to live their lives and deal with the struggles that they have, but also be part of something bigger. Um, do you want me to respond to that? Yes. Or I also yeah. see hands, should we say yeah, maybe ask questions let's, for later? Uh, let's let's okay. talk between yourselves for like five more minutes, and then we're going to have lots of time for questions and answers. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is very, very complicated, and I wonder if if we get into the complexity, we could, we, instead of forming a union around a specific lender, could we form it around a particular security? And just, you know, is it possible to track down some of these mortgage securities and say, here are all the investors, here are all the debtors, and if these debtors band together, they can screw the investors instead of the other way around. Uh, my understanding is that it's, one, it's, it's just incredibly, it's so complex that even the people who are packaging this and selling it don't really know what they're doing. It's complex and it's opaque. And it's opaque it's that you, that, it might not be possible to find who, like, my student loans might have been bundled into a security. Uh, is it possible for me to find out who the investors were who invested in that? Is it possible to find out who the other debtors were that were bundled into that? My understanding is that it's not, but... Well, there's laws around mortgage lending that say you have to be able to find out who owns your loan, and there are millions of people in this country for the last X years during the foreclosure crisis who can't find out who owns their loan, who holds the note. Um, and you know, they doesn't stop the mortgage servicers from going to court, even though they don't hold the note and sue people for their homes. But you know, we, we're starting to put an end to that as well. So yeah, I mean, it's complex that, you know, another thing that we think about is, it's not around the debt exactly, but debt and credit are kind of sides of the coin. There is a, I think, a renewed interest in community-based financial institutions, like community-based credit unions, which are cooperatives that are based on principles of solidarity, that are based on democratic operation and participation of the membership. The members, if you put a dollar with a credit union of any kind, uh, but I'm thinking these community-based credit unions. Do people know in New York we have a whole network of community-based Financial institutions, people know about this? And you know, like on the Lower East Side, there's the Lower East Side People's Federal Credit Union, and there's Beth X in the Bronx, and there are others throughout the city. These are financial institutions with a social justice mission. They're structured as cooperatives, and they are in part you know, cleaning up the mess of a lot of the abusive practices that we've been, well, I've been alluding to, but certainly they are also helping people deal with debt. So it seems like they already are in communities, they have members. By definition, credit unions are predicated on a concept of a common bond. That's the actual language that's used. And so it, it's sort of the affirmative side of the equation that might be an interesting constellation of institutions to tap into in thinking this through. I don't know, just sort of people come to them with all sorts of you know, debt situations so they can sort of look at the cross-section of issues in a way that is very local. I mean, we work with neighborhoods that are based in low-income neighborhoods and communities of color, so we have a very particular stratum of issues that we're looking at, but it transcends everything, because it affects everyone, like you said. Just also, I'm a proselytizer for community and financial institutions, so if you don't know that, there's so many, yeah, there's so many questions in the audience. Uh, I think that the, the scariest part of what you are talking about is um, uh, in these credit reports and uh, you know and sort of practices when the employer, employers and uh, insurance company are checking on your background that it can be implemented as a law because 
I was applying for a job and I was not in a job, I was in a teaching position. And they asked me, uh, and uh, they asked me to sign the permission to check my credit history. And that was the university. And when I asked why, you know, why, and they said that uh, the chair of the department, she scratched her head and she said, I think this is the law. So, and it is not the law. I hear tell yeah, you that yeah, it's yeah, absolutely yeah. not true. But it's always in her head that mm -hmm. it's probably a law, you know, because she knows that her school is doing this. But it's, it can be, I, I think that this is what, because when we're talking about credit response and all, all kinds, of, we need to know what is on. On, on the table, right? What was the agenda? So, and we should really, you know, try to prevent this to, to you know, to be taken because they outsmart us. They always outsmart us. You know, we can organize, we can we do, and we do all kinds of things, but they come up with new, you know, they because they they have a law in their in the hands, and they they can do, you know, you know, that we can we we can't do. So it's, it's, yeah, I think that this is something that is coming. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's illegal to discriminate in hiring and to the extent that checking people's credit has a, what's called a disparate impact or disproportionately harmful impact on protected groups, like based on race, for example, or gender, et cetera, that's illegal. And there's a, a lot coming up that is showing that this is actually discriminatory, it's having a discriminatory effect. There's a bill in our city council for people who think in these terms that would make it per se discrimination to check someone's credit in the employment context. So if you're interested in that, let me know. We have a whole campaign, and there's a veto-proof majority of city council members right now that back it. It passed a same bill that would ban the use of credit in employment just passed our New York State Assembly last week. Because it is a civil rights issue, but it's also a convergence of all of the things that we're talking about, and it's a you know sort of an illustration, if you will. Is that law going to pass? In the state or in the city? In, in the, in either. It's gonna, I think it's gonna pass the city. Uh, there's some, this mayoral campaign going on, right? You know, there's this mayor, I think it's pretty clear he would veto it. Um, so anyone who wants to get involved, let us know, because there are zillions of groups around the city that are working on this campaign, and it's one of these things where you can just put an end to it. Um, and at the state level as well. The problem is that the credit in bureau, the credit reporting agencies, have a vested interest in laws like this not passing because, right, they want to sell their <laughs> to employers. And uh, so they fight really hard to get exemptions. So a lot of states, there are nine states that have passed laws that ban the use of credit reports and employment, except where it's justified or they ban the use of credit reports and employment, except where there's a bona fide purpose, except where someone's in a managerial position, except, 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 except. And in city council, we have no exceptions in the bill there. We have no exceptions in the bill that just passed our assembly. So it's all about making it happen and, and pushing that up. And stuff like this, you know, it's, again, I was talking about root causes versus surface work or, or direct response to, to human need in the immediate sphere. This is the kind of thing that if it, it kicks up the issues and it gets people talking about, well, what are these credit reports and why are people looking at them and why are people considering this information somehow reflective of someone's character? You know, like, what is that? And it, it's very important for those conversations to take place. More questions in the audience? First off, thanks so much for coming in. Thomas, I'm, just, I'm curious what uh, what the learning has been in Strike Debt since the Rolling Jubilees and the Editor's Manual in terms of organizing, building power. Uh, you guys obviously were able to gain a huge amount of media attention rates, tons and tons of money. But even aside from organizing 100,000 people, if you could just organize 10,000 New Yorkers to take action, that would be a big deal. And you know, Occupy has been, been one of the biggest problems for us is actually just rubber meets the road, make sure people actually see the event they're supposed to go to. And, um, and, and can you start by just like very clearly laying out what Rolling Jubilee was to make sure that we're all on the same page? Sure, yeah. So, uh, as 
Sarah was describing that debt buying process where debt gets sold to investors for pennies on the dollar. The Rolling Jubilee raised $600,000 in small donations from all over the world. I gave it 50. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we go and buy debt. So far we've bought exclusively medical debt uh, for pennies on the dollar. And then rather than collecting it like these investors would, we abolish it. Wipe it up. Um, and it's it's been you know to, to me the the project will only be successful if it leads to exactly what you're describing. It, it has to be a spark that, that leads to an actual movement. And uh, so far, I think it's done a really great job at illuminating parts of the debt world that people don't know exist. Most people don't know that 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 gets sold as a commodity. Um, uh, it's been fun to see the Wikipedia entry on debt buyer change dramatically after the Rolling Jubilee launched. And it's been fun to watch the message boards on, on debt buying message boards talk about it. Um, uh, and I, I should be clear that um, you know this debtors union idea is it's an embryonic idea right now. It's not officially a strike debt project. It's things that. Those of us who have been working in strike that are are thinking about, but it needs it needs some serious working and workshopping and brainstorming and development. The Rolling Jubilee was in development for nine months before we were able to bring it. Before we were able to say, we know this will work. Let's let's bring it for consensus and, and make it happen. So the debtors union, if it turns out to be a viable option, uh, it will probably be several months from now before. You know, or, or it, it might be its own thing. It might not be a strike that thing. Uh, so I, just to be clear about that. Um, for myself, it's I'm still learning a tremendous amount about how debt works, and it seems like a never-ending fractal level puzzle. Um, but it's always exciting because each new thing that you learn, you think, ooh, how can we use that? How can we twist it? But if you have ideas for things that require, like, okay, let's get 10,000 people in New York to come to an event. What should that event be? What should we have them do? Well, that's a great question. One of the things that I find very interesting is that you, you, Sarah, were actually talking about uh, the idea that is right, that uh, there wouldn't necessarily have to be a strike, per se. You know, just, just the fact of people organizing together and so they can represent what this debt looks like from the other from the other side actually has great value before anybody is at is at risk. I think the prospect of a strike needs to loom. Oh, sure. But um, yeah, it's sort of to be determined, right? It's sort of a, people join it. They're part of something. If it's a true collective, it's the people who are part of it and form what the action looks like. But I, I think the strike needs to be in the. Yeah. I think it might scare some of the people we work with off at the outset. So yeah. I think building it up and showing how it works and then it, there's leverage. And it, it's not going to be, I mean, we were at our office talking about this, and then a few people were talking about this when I first got here, which is that, you know, Bank of America is a multi trillion dollar institution. So, you know, we're talking here about a sheer scale issue. So I don't think it's about having so much debt. In the you know sort of in the aggregate or in the escrow account, that's going to be the leverage point. It's the politics of it. It's something that we've always been struck by in the many years that we've been doing bank accountability work. Is that you know a scrappy neighborhood group can get tremendous leverage around a bank just based on sort of reputational risks or perceived reputational risks to the financial institutions. They don't want to be in the paper in some bad way, which is hilarious given what's happened. <laughs> but so but we continue to work with groups that do that. You know, hey, we're going to expose this. It's like, no, no, please don't. Or, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that the power is in the formation and banding and, and work of that union moving forward. It speaks volumes more than the actual dollar economic power. Uh, can you guys talk a little bit about what it would require? Can you talk about that? Sarah, you've been talking a little bit about um, uh, credit unions. What would require to have sort of a strike fund and an alternative form of credit uh, to exist in order for people to resist and not take credit from Wall Street? And what the challenges would be with regards to
opposed to just a lack of capital for people to have access to? Is there any thoughts on that question? Well, I don't know if it's a response or if you just conjured this thought out of my brain. But, you know, Thomas talked a little bit about payday loans. We, payday loans are categorically illegal in New York. People know what a payday loan is. It's a short-term, very high-cost, usurious loan, usually a small-dollar loan, that's made to working people who don't have enough money to get from check to check. And, you know, actually, it's not just working people. Payday lenders are perfectly happy to make loans to people who get government benefits. As long as you can show that you have a bank account that they can wire money right into, and as long as you can show a pay stub or a government benefits receipt so that they uh, can predict that you're going to get that money on Friday or next week or whatever. They may do this short-term loan, and it is the debt trap that Thomas talked about. It is roundly understood that this is a predatory loan. It's illegal in New York because we have a criminal usury law in New York that's one of the strongest in the country. Anybody want to guess what is the most you can charge someone in New York without committing a felony? What's our, what's our interest rate cap in New York, our criminal interest rate cap? 25%. 25%. So penny lenders charge upwards of 500% annual percent rate, 700%, 700%. So they're not, they're not doing business here except illegally. So I was thinking that might be an interesting resistance, is everybody understands that these are predatory loans. It targets working people largely. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. The debts are bought and sold, so the paper is like sold on the cheap for, to those debt buyers. They are up to no good. You put your information when you apply for a payday loan on the internet, you think you're applying to a payday lender, they sell it to people. There are people who will buy it, even just by the fact you apply, they'll start having you in debt collection. It's a rancid industry, well, you get the point. So it seems like that might be an interesting way to go as well, right? You start to wrap, use that profile of something that everyone understands is predatory. So you're talking about access to credit. People might have access to credit, but it may be very harmful very, very uh, sort of, you know, cash stripping, wealth stripping, destructive forms of credit. So it seems like that, I don't know, it just made me think about something. And payday lending was started by two people, a guy named Alan Jones, a guy named Toby McKenzie. Toby McKenzie filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> he gets to go to bankruptcy court and get his debts wiped out. He just died a couple months ago, so that's all up in the air now. But it's the people he put in debt don't get to do that, but he gets to do that. I and mean, that just boils my blood. Um, but let me add to that, that very few states ban payday lending outright. And so it seems like in terms of like a debtor's union and a strike and a resistance, you know, you kind of get really far down the block in terms of people also sort of the perceptions around it and some of the kind of antipathy people might have to an action like this because why should you pay out on a jury's debt that's structured to hook you into a cycle of long-term indebtedness because you don't have enough money to get by because wages are stagnant, because people, you know, we don't have a living wage, et cetera, et cetera. So just okay, uh, sorry. One quick follow-up before the next question. We could create a ready-made union and say, everybody go get a payday loan from Cash Advance and refuse to repay it. Just get a million people who are willing to do that I've been told payday lenders don't actually report to the credit reporting agency. They've got their own system. I don't know. Well, they'll true. report the negative payment, but they're not going to report the positive payment. Wow. So it's like, damn, did you do damn, 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 did you do We have time for one more question. I, I, I just wanted to introduce an example. I work at a group called the Enrich Trust, and we operate a credit unit and a nonprofit in Washington Heights. Great. So we are one of the community development financial right. institutions. And so at our credit union, we're able to originate and offer financial products that are tailored to the needs of the communities that we serve. For example, a loan shark refinance loan. So if you have a loan shark loan outstanding, which is similar to a payday loan, often in terms of the terms and the debt and interest of the payments, you can come to the credit union and then basically buy out your loan shark debt and then restructure the terms of the payment and the rate of the payment so that they're on the terms that you understand and they're more affordable. So similarly, to your question about credit that's available, we also, also now offer a credit card product that's meant to reduce the amount of interest you have and the percentage, credit rate of interest, and then similarly the term of the loan. So 
it's out there, and I think it strikes the sort of the hard feasibility question, which is that there are people who aren't quite as far out as the tenors union does, but are still doing things that are, in essence, a civil rights issue about the people that we're serving or that take advantage of by the mainstream financial industry. So this idea about the payday loans, now the government thing, because first of all, we all get $300, $500 loans, right? We get that into our account, so we get to drain that as a loop, we turn it around. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just to follow up on that um, last comment about credit unions, Strike that has chapters in a few different places. In uh, the Bay Area, they're thinking about debtors' unions along those terms. Let's go out and find 1,000 people who've got a uh, revolving credit card debt at various institutions and then create a class out of those people and move them in mass, into move their debts in mass into a, a credit union that can take credit cards, which, you know, there are, only a, um, there are only some credit unions, my understanding is, that issue credit cards, and yours is, is one of them that we could, we could do that. So if any of you live near there and have credit card debt, you should, you should move it. I mean, it's tricky, right? Because you don't want to replace indebtedness with other forms of indebtedness, right? So it, there's like the short term, and then there's the medium term, and then there's the long term. So in the immediate term, you might alleviate some of the pressure by refinancing expensive debt. But in the longer arc view, I think we need to be kind of transcending some of that. I mean, a lot of the talk even about how do we deal with, you know, predatory payday loans? Well, let's make a a better, not quite so noxious, short-term loan product. You know, and that, that's, to me, where a lot of the conversation is nationally around financial justice issues. So something like a debtor's union or other forms of collective response take us out of that frame of sort of a not as bad, toxic financial product. Um, and so, or maybe it's, you know, looks fine and shiny, but it's still about indebtedness. And a lot of our, I don't want to say this before we end tonight, because a lot of the talk about even anti-poverty initiatives is about lending. Grameen Bank, right? The famous, you know, Grameen Bank. It's about how do we alleviate poverty? We make loans to people. And so we have a whole way that we think about poverty right now, which is hooked around this concept of debt. And I think it's something that people aren't talking about barely at all. Is that a double negative? Sorry. We're aware of that. Um, the good news is that there are drinks and snacks here, and that this is actually very into the crowd, uh, and that these people are going to stay, and we can actually continue this conversation one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, I invite all of you to, to uh, join us uh, for a glass of wine and to continue uh, the conversation about this very important concept uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Don and Shelley for, uh, for their support, this wonderful venue, and Don uh, for, for your legacy as well. Very, very keen on that. And I want to invite everybody to find out more about the Play Press. We, um, we're going to be coming back in the fall with lots of interesting programs just like this that, uh, that talk about the power of art in everyday life. So uh, like us on Facebook and, and join us, follow us on Twitter. Thanks, guys. And thank you.